Let me explain, ladies and gentlemen, that I'm here really this evening to act as a sort of grand inquisitor. Oh, is that what you're doing? Yes, sort of, so they tell me. Um, to act on your behalf and put a few questions to Cliff so that we can get to know you, hopefully, a little bit better. Um, and to learn why you think the way you do about all sorts of things. Um, I just noticed you said that you were here on holiday, and I suppose it's pure coincidence, isn't it, that in Perth there was the Hopman Cup, in Sydney there was the New South Wales Open, and in Melbourne there's the Australian Open. That just happened by chance. Of course I knew the tennis was yes. on. <laughs> and you're playing, just a little. Yes, well, I, I, I tend to try and play as much as I can. It's a great workout for me. I, I, I get a bit bored with running and swimming, and although I know swimming is really good for the body, but... Um, I, I get bored easily, and whereas if you're playing a game, and also if you can't do that, if you can't play that game that well, you have to really concentrate. So when I'm on tour, I try and play an hour or two hours a day, maybe four days a week, and it's great therapy for me because it is. I find it a very, it's a very difficult game just watching the way some of these people hit that ball looks so simple. I, every time I ever go out there, I go out there going, "Hey, this is today's of the day." You and are I come a off tennis thinking fanatic, tomorrow. aren't you? I mean, you really love the game, don't you? You're yes, it, uh, yes. I mean, it, it came into my life rather late, really, for me to be any good at it. I mean, I, I was 40 before I ever started playing, and that year I met the uh, ex-New Zealand number one, Oni Perrin, and he was 38 and had been retired for about 10 years. <laughs> I mean, it's frightening, really, but it really is a young person's game. But um, you can have a great deal of fun at it, you see, because as long as I'm playing within people who are at my standard, it's great fun. You win some, lose some. Um, but also, I mean, I hit with Paul McNamee uh, because I, I said to him I'd play in his pro celebrity tournament and I haven't played because of a fight, slightly dodgy back for the last couple of weeks. I, I haven't played to give it a chance to, for the injury to heal. And I hit with him and he it blasted me off the court, really. And um, he, said, he said afterwards, he said, well, you know, I, I, because I said, thank you for a wonderful hit. And he said, well, you know, when I have a hit with people, I, I hit flat out. And I, I, I said, well, I didn't really notice, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great fun to play with people who really know what they're doing, because the ball goes where it should. <laughs> I've played with people who don't have that ability, and it's... Um... <laughs> I'll change the subject rapidly. <laughs> if you have been in music for four decades, haven't you? Says he, getting his own back. Yes, I have. It's, four decades. It's 30 years, but I've, I've been singing during the 50s, you see. I came in very late in the 50s. Um, but nevertheless, it was 58, and therefore I've sung in the 50s, I've sung in the 60s, 70s, and now, of course, the 80s. So uh, it's quite something. I hasten to add, I was a child star. I mean, I was but barely out of school. it's the custard that's kept you going, I <laughs> Yeah, when I can't eat it, I slap it on. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're, it's an extraordinary career, yours. I mean, in Britain, you've just, just as we left, you'd got a single yet again at number one for four weeks. Yes. Your 99th single. I wish it was my 100th. You wish it what? Because of its success, you mean? Yeah, because it's made it really difficult to find the 100th now. You know, how do you follow a number one? It's very, very difficult to get consecutive number ones, and obviously it would have been really nice if Mistletoe Wine had been my hundredth, and then I could have gone out with a fanfare and said, look, they are my hundredth is number one, but now it could be an absolute dead flop. <laughs> it's extraordinary. So, uh, I mean, it's an out-and-out -out Christmas record, that, isn't it? But we had dinner with EMI the other day, and they said that here, after Christmas, it's sort of doing well. It's rocketing yeah, it's, out it's, the charts. It's, That's very weird, isn't it? Well, I don't know. You see, we, we in Britain tend to... Everything becomes Christmas orientated around about the December the 1st. And um, DJs don't play Christmas songs until December the 1st. In other words, they don't listen. They, they would not have listened to my record and to see if there was any uh, validity in playing it just as a record. They'd have just said, oh, that's a Christmas song, so we won't play that just yet. Whereas in other countries, it seems they just play it as a record. So it's possible that the record could even go higher now. It went from the low 40s up to the 28th position or something like that last week. And... Um, we, I was amazed at first, and then I thought, wait a minute, now why? The original reason why I recorded the song was because I thought it was a really nice song. The fact that it happens to be about Christmas, it, it, it fitted the season. But there's no reason why people wouldn't buy it in the middle of summer. I've often thought, you know, those carols that we sing. Well, you know, I, we sing carols every year, and I, they're the best. They really are the best. I wish we could sing them at other times of the year. The record of this hit 
had 40 strings on it or whatever, great big orchestra. It had 40 voices on it. 40 voices. Yeah. There's one guitar and there's one voice, but <laughs> can, can you do a version of it? Yes. Mistletown Wire? Yes, I can. the song, of course, that held Kylie and Jason at bay for four weeks, wasn't it? Yes, and, and <laughs> angry. And angry, yes. <laughs> it was, uh, it was um, a fascinating time, really, because uh, the, the Australians certainly made a big attack on our charts, and uh, Kylie and Jason were two, and Angry Anderson was three. But I, you see, I think sometimes when you get there first, somehow or another you're able to cling on in there. And of course I did have going in my favour the fact that uh, it was really heavily into Christmas at that particular time. And uh, I mean, I, I think grandmothers were going in to buy the current number one, whether they knew what it was or not. <laughs> when you get back to England, you start making another album. Your hundredth single will be released a couple of months after that. You've already got plans to do another tour here in Australia early next year, early in 90. Yes. And so it, I mean, it goes on year after year. And the inevitable question, and I mean, the press asks you it all the time, when does it stop? I mean, are you going to be wheeled on when you're 72? <laughs> well, I mean, a I mean, geriatric rock and roll performer. <laughs> The big question is, are you going to be able to wheel me on? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, it's, it's strange because when I was 18 and starting my career, if you'd asked me, and, you know, if, you'd asked me if, if it was possible for uh, a person above the age of 30, really, to, to get records in the charts, I think I'd have very quickly said, no, it's not, not feasible. And because that, that was based on the fact that when I was 18, all my aunts and uncles who were into their 30s and 40s, they didn't like rock and roll. They didn't relate to that new form of music. They were into big bands and jazz singers and things like that. So obviously my, my, my feelings about it would have been colored by their, you know, their, their pressures on me. But now, you see, it seems to me that as long as you can make a record that's, that's okay, people will buy it. They don't really care how old or how young you are. I mean, I, I, mean, I can sit and listen to... Uh, you know, my favorite band at the moment is Climbing Fish, and I don't know how old they are, but I, I bet they're not in their 30s yet. And I can get a kick through listening to a really good album by them. You know, Love Changes Everything is a fantastic album. And, um, but you see, they also like some of my stuff, I found out. So, it, well, it's they're accounting for thing. taste, is it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you said that under your breath. But, uh, yeah, but it seems to me that rock and roll seems to have broken down a very big generation gap. Because, I mean, my sister's kids like some of the bands that are out now and, and are quite amazed that I know the songs, even if I don't like them all. There's a number of them that I really like. So, um, I guess, if I can still... I, I mean, it depends. You know, when you ask me whether I'm going to be able to sing in, when I'm 70, who knows? If my voice holds out, then I would be able to sing. But whether I've still got hits or not depends on whether I've found the right songs to present to the public. And if, not, if, the, if both those things go down the tubes, then I don't have a career. I mean, I reckon as long as I can stand up, I'll do it. <laughs> Might as well. I mean, you know, why not? <laughs> Cliff, what is very evident, you know, in talking to you just for a few minutes, some people listening, will recognize that you're an enthusiast, you know? I mean, you love your tennis, and, you know, we can understand that. You're still as enthusiastic about your career, it seems, as ever you were, even after 30 years. What people perhaps find it more difficult to understand, the world at large find difficult, is to understand why you have the same sort of enthusiasm for your Christian faith. Now, a lot of people regard belief as something that's all right, personal and private, but you seem to have really, you've been shouting it from the rooftops for a long time, and that baffles people. What is it that you find in Christianity that enthuses you? Well, first of all, let me say that I, I do shout about it, but only when people bring the subject up. I mean, the press have often said, you know, oh, he's suddenly... They, they, they tend to quote you as though you come out with great statements, whereas in point of fact, the, the statements are only answers, in fact, to their questions. See, I'm very happy to talk about my faith. If someone, you've brought up the subject first and of course I'm happy to talk about it and of course tonight's the kind of night that is perfect for that 
But um, the reason why I don't think I should keep it to myself anyway is based on the fact that, you see, when I first started looking towards spiritual things, if the people I had spoken to had decided that it was something that was very personal and private, where would I have got it from? I mean, these people took me to hear speakers. I, I, I met people who were, were able to, to deal with the subjects that were worrying me. And uh, if they had decided that this is something very personal and private, you know, Christianity is something that you don't uh, shout about, well, I mean, I wouldn't have found what I found in the end. So it seems to me that none of us who call ourselves Christians have the right to keep it to ourselves. I think it would be wrong for me to, to go out of my way at every press conference or every time I appeared on television to blazon it at people, you know. I mean, I think that would be wrong. But you'd be surprised. There's never been any need for me to do that ever. Not once. And I've done all these major talk shows. We have a guy called Terry Wogan at home. And uh, of course, Michael Parkinson, you all know, he used to be a big talk show at home. And now, uh, uh, does he still do talk shows here? I know he loves it in Australia and he's done a lot of work here. But you know, I can sit and talk to these guys on a gen just a regular TV show and guaranteed, Bill, I would not have to nudge once. They bring up the subject of my faith. And I, and it's, I like that because they're, they're being honest. And because of their questioning, I'm able to be honest as well. And for me to be able to talk about uh, Jesus and God and what they mean to my life is, is relatively simple now. It's become easier as I've done it more often. Let me slightly rephrase the question then. What is it in Christianity that you find so exciting? Well, firstly, well, there are a couple of things really, but firstly, let me say that when something works for you, it's good. You know, one of the main reasons why we look towards anything vaguely spiritual is because we're vaguely unhappy with what we've got going for us in life. You know, we're, we're either despondent because our job thing doesn't work or relationships don't work or, or whatever. There's something that's bothering us and we feel there's a gap. And although, for instance, my career was working really well, I didn't feel that... I, I kept saying to myself, could this possibly be all there is? You know, it's not a brand new question. I don't think there are any new ones. And I went through what thousands, if not millions of people have gone through before me, saying, is rock and roll really the reason for living? And the answer kept coming back to me, no, it can't be. So I began to have this slight despondency. I was never into deep depression, but uh, I couldn't understand why I wasn't hysterically happy because I was doing, remember, the one thing I've been wanting to do since I first heard Elvis. I mean, I heard Elvis and I wanted to wake up and be him, never mind like him. I would, I would like to have woken up and found myself, huh? <laughs> but it obviously wasn't going to work. So, with all of this excitement in my career, it was a bit disturbing for me to find that I, that I didn't feel 100% happy about everything. And so, as I say, it's a natural progression, it seems to me. You start to look into spiritual directions because you've, you're there in the material and it's not sufficient, so you look towards the spiritual. And when I started to talk, you see, I spoke over a period of three years to Jewish people, to Jehovah's Witnesses, and I finally met a group of people who just called themselves Orthodox Christians, but they had a, a way of speaking about their faith that was different. They talked about this relationship with Jesus. They were so convinced that Jesus did exist, you know. My question marks were, well, how do we know he existed? How do we know if he did exist, that he did die, and that he's alive again? Those are all big issues that I wanted to check out. Once I started to check them out, I mean, it, was, it became painfully obvious that I was not going to break the story down. And when I finally became a Christian, all the depression, the slight depression, the despondency certainly that I had, has melted away in my life. Okay, I know, we can look at plane crashes and natural disasters in this world. That's what Tear Fund is up to its eyeballs in, disasters in this world where they shouldn't be, disease where they needn't be. And when you look at those sort of things, of course you can't jump about smiling all the time. Of course you, you, you weep because of other people's suffering. But generally speaking, I don't feel that the whole cause is hopeless anymore. I do feel there's a reason for us to be alive. There's a way that we can make our lives full and complete, even though we've got to put up with the fact that people will die while this meeting is going on. And people will be born by their thousands and will need help tomorrow because of their birth. Uh, in spite of all of that though, I still feel that there is something really worth keeping a hold of. So that's why I'm excited, because the thing works. The second thing, of course, is because it's painfully true. I say painfully because I don't know of anybody who has ever checked out Christianity to prove it right. We all of us try to prove it wrong. I mean, of course we do. You know, didn't anybody, I don't know about you, if you those of you who are Christians now must have said it sometime, oh, how do we know about the virgin, what about the virgin birth? 
You know, what about walking on water? <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> but you know what I mean, we tend to go into it trying to break it down, which in a way I suppose is natural. I th and in a way I think it's great, because the one thing that Christianity can take is any amount of questioning you can give it. Any amount whatsoever. Because it's based, the platform is the reality and the fact, the historical fact of Jesus having existed. And when I discovered that there was more evidence to prove that Jesus existed than there was to prove that Julius Caesar existed, I was jubilant as a Christian. I thought, isn't it fantastic? Because so many, no one would ever query whether Julius Caesar existed. And yet I know at school, we had a period uh, during the, the years I was at school when we as fifth formers actually believed that Jesus was just the figment of imagination. Just the disciples made up this wonderful character that they, they would hold up and, and hope that everyone would try to emulate and therefore the world would be okay. Well, it's not, you know, there's more to it than that. Jesus was an actual fact. So there's a couple of reasons why I find it exciting. Of course, the, uh, the whole essence of the whole subject is what you've said. Is it true? Yes. I mean, if it isn't, we're all wasting our time. We might as well get up and go home, aren't we, really? But absolutely. for you, you are convinced that it is. Oh, I'm convinced, absolutely. I mean, you see, I'm not a great, I'm not an intellectual person, Bill. I can't, I'm not an academic. I didn't do that well at school. You know, I, I did well at English, you know. I spoke it quite well. <laughs> but you know, I'm not an academic, but I feel that you don't necessarily have to be an intellectual or a great academic to be logical. And if you approach it logically and you ask your questions with honesty, you will be surprised at the rational answers that come back. And then you have to do something about those answers. Of course you do. And uh, I, I, I got to my conclusions and made my commitment. What did you do? I was just going to ask you that. You made your commitment, you see. I, there are so many ideas about what a Christian is. What did you do? I mean, I know it's a long time ago. I'm um, just put it briefly because it's a long story. Uh, well, but, I mean, in the mid '60s, did you join something? Did you, you know, <laughs> no, did you no. sign on a dotted line? What did you no. do that makes you now, all this time later, say yes? I know I'm a Christian. Well, having said to you that I, uh, I spent about three years really plowing through various d philosophies and people telling me this and that and me eventually getting through to read my Bible and, and then even then still clawing through the facts and trying to find out what there was to believe and if I could possibly believe it. You see, when I finally came to the conclusion that yes, I did believe that Jesus did exist, there was weighed, the evidence outweighed anything else, he definitely did exist. It then posed the problem, if Jesus existed, then did the things they say about him really happen? Were the things that he claimed really true? So you then have to start, but now you've got a, posit a, a positive historical character, you can now start questioning him. So that, did Jesus say this? Did Jesus do that? And you start questioning it, and you read the Bible, and you find, and this is what amazed me too, that even there, at that particular time in history, remember we're looking at it from 2,000 years back, and it's much more difficult for us, but even there, and there at that time, the opposition actually trumped up charges. They bribed people to tell lies about him, just to get him uh, committed to the cross. So they, they, they couldn't flaw this man. And I must admit, I found no flaw. I've yet to meet anybody that doesn't think Jesus is a terrific bloke. I mean, everybody thinks that Jesus is the greatest man that ever lived. They, they think that. Many of them will say that. I've had many, many students and people in our industry that say that to me. And yet, if, if you say to them, but this bloke was the son of God, they go, oh, well, no, I don't know about that. In other words, what they're saying is that Jesus is a terrific bloke, but he tells lies. Well, they are, because Jesus is the one that said that, you know, his father was in heaven. If you have seen me, you have seen my father. He was making claims to divinity and, and to, to godliness. So, um, with all those things, and this is the final crunch, because it is a long story, and I know we don't have all that time, but when I finally came to the conclusion that he did exist, that yes, he did die a specific horrific death, so that I needn't fear death, in the long term, of course I f don't want to get run over. But in, if sitting here looking at it, death doesn't bother me, it, that, that future death. Um, so I believe that he died for me. And possibly one of the most important factors that I came to agree with was the fact that Jesus could only do anything in life today because he was still alive. So the resurrection was something that you do have to check out. And uh, I thought, well, about four or five hundred people saw him after his crucifixion. Now even if 20, if 50% of them were lying, that's still a couple hundred people.
And that was enough, I thought. So anyway, Bill. Well, I'm going after, to start oh, in and say this sounds all very academic, I, you know. Well, is it? It's the logical part yeah. of taking the steps through. Yeah. Uh, and so having believed these things, and really you do need to believe these factors, I still wasn't a Christian. I didn't feel part of the team. And I lay on my bed one night and someone had said to me, you see, read Revelation 3.20. Behold, Jesus said this, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock, and whoever opens the door, I will come in and sup with him. Jesus is saying that to people who read that passage. And I, I lay on my bed thinking, well, if, if there was a door in my chest, I would rip it open. How does one open the door? How do you invite this being in that you know exists but you can't see or touch or feel? And in the end, I just lay there and said, look, okay, okay I believe all these things, and I rattled off all the things I believed and said, so therefore I know you exist, I know you are there. I would like you to be part of my life. Please, take over. And I wish that I could say there was some great, uh, you know, explosion at least. You know, next door or something. <laughs> but... Uh, there was nothing like that. I can't really claim that there was anything great. There was, St. Paul had a wonderful conversion. He was blinded for three days, lights, a voice spoke to him in, the, in a dusty road. And I didn't have that at all. I felt quite good, I slept quite well, and the next day I felt not bad at all. <laughs> but, you see, but you see, the trouble is, but my story is that psychiatrists and psychologists would have a field day with it. They would, up to that point. What they can't deal with is the fact that it's been 22 years. So now I can look back and say, yes, that's, the, that's what I did. I did that and I became a Christian. And from that moment on, things seemed to change. From that moment on, people uh, told me that I was different in some way. They didn't always recognize exactly what it was. And I used to silently think to myself, is he really, is he really appearing in my life, you know, that someone else can see that I can't even feel sometimes? And the answer obviously is yes. And as the years go on, so you become more confident in your faith, so you're more sure of his presence in your life and it's a, it's a growing process really and obviously in my case it's, it's, it hasn't finished yet obviously. Cliff I think I have to ask you after that how how that fits into your story because a quarter of an hour ago we were talking about you in the mid 60s making what was a personal commitment now since then there have been a lot of changes in your life which you would look back to that commitment being responsible for and your involvement with Tear Fund in England is just one of those changes isn't it how did you becoming a Christian in the mid 60s lead to your presence on a platform like this this evening because you see a lot of people think that becoming a Christian is something cramping you know, it's a matter of you don't do this and you don't do that, and life becomes much more narrow. Now, I mean, you know, we're talking about very broad horizons. Well, it seems to me, I mean, I'd, I've never felt cramped by my faith. I've, I, in fact, for me, it was the great enlightening. You know, freedom is something that we all cherish, we value very greatly. But you see, there is no freedom unless there is a, a law. It's freedom within the law that, that gives us real freedom. The fact that the law stops or attempts to stop people robbing you, killing you, cheating you, allows you to live a life that's free. And uh, it just seems to me that um, freedom is what we want. And if, if you become a Christian, there are many, many things that become a responsibility for you. And it seemed to me that God was nudging me certainly in that area because very early on, uh, of course, you know, I thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm a rock and roll singer, I, I'm, therefore I'm famous, I've got money. And um, Tear Fund, and of course I wanted to be involved in something, but you see, I, I don't know about you, but I, I've been through my, oh, I'm still a little bit cynical, I suppose, but I'm not as bad as I was when I first became a Christian, certainly about charitable works, because I didn't know who to trust. I didn't know who, who to give money to, who to give my time and energies to. Because you kept, I read about grain rotting on quaysides. I read about people getting blankets when it was 115 in the shade. And I thought, well, you know, the money that is needed is always going to be needed, but the money that we earn is hard earned. And I don't, none of us should want to waste it. Well, none of us should just want to dump it in a drain just because it makes us, us feel better. We ought, to re we ought to know for certain that it's going to be used well and wisely. So, Somebody had suggested it, because I'd voiced my opinion sometime about wanting to be involved in some kind of charitable work. 
and somebody had said this is new group of people called Tear Fund and uh, we did a kind of a practice run at it really we did a concert at the Albert Hall in London and had a fantastic evening and, and, and it was what was it about 20 odd years now yeah, yeah, 20 odd years ago and uh, I think we raised about three thousand pounds six thousand dollars and we bought a Land Rover and sent it, sent it across. Well, I mean, 3,000 pounds an hour just about by the wheel, won't it? <laughs> but nevertheless, suddenly we thought, hey, this is working. And the reason why I was drawn to Tear Fund was because it was a group of Christians who were disturbed by the needs of the world and who wanted to do something about it. And you see, Tear Fund works this way. Christians give to Tear Fund, which is a Christian group of people who administer the money and send the money and sometimes uh, they don't, I mean sometimes when they sell send clothes or aspirin or drugs or whatever that is sent to Christians in the areas of need which means you see and as Peter was talking about um, the very rich and the very poor is because there's a great deal of corruption in these lands I mean it's, it's ironic really that where there's these fantastic desperate needy people there are incredibly rich corrupt people well tear fund somehow because of this structure bypasses the corruption so I thought to myself well, now I can give my money and my time and feel that, that I'm part of something that's actually valuable that's actually working you know the money is going to go to buy what is needed in those areas because it's being administered by people I could trust Tear Fund is not the only organization that works this way I mean this is what we're talking about tonight so Tear Fund will be heavily featured tonight of course but um, but Tear Fund was the one that I was introduced to and, and as I say it reached a, I'd reached a point in my life when I felt that I ought to be doing something but I didn't want to just do it in a void I, I needed to feel that what I was doing ha was going to have some value and so Tear Fund came along and it seemed to be the right thing to do so I did it and I've, in fact the interesting thing is seeing those pictures was that the very first place I ever visited too was Bangladesh yeah. and it was a very harrowing experience. It makes a difference, you see, that's a privilege to go. I mean, the folk that have just spoken to us have been and seen these situations. As we look at the pictures, it all seems very alien, doesn't it? I mean, it's not our culture, it's not where we are. Did it make a big difference to you actually going to see for yourself? Oh, yes. I mean, I can't say it's the most enjoyable time I've ever had. It was a very disturbing time. Uh, when you hear that people the average age is 38, 40, I think we were told it was 40 when we were there, but it seems to have dropped. It meant that if you'll meet somebody of 36 or 37, they're coming to the end of their lives. I, I mean, it's frightening to live, to actually come out of our society and go into that sort of situation. And when I went, it was 1973, and they just had all that, um, the civil war thing, and they'd been split, and there were great refugee camps in Bangladesh, massive great ref refugee camps. We weren't taken into the very bad ones. I mean, I hate to think what they were like because the ones that we were permitted to go into were horrific. Thousands of people in an acre or something like that. And, and we met nurses. In fact, we were there to encourage the tear fund nurses that were there. We met nurses who were having to do the most horrific things. Uh, five of them were working in a hospital with 500 beds. That was it. Five, five of them dealing with all of that. Um, they were having to go out, for instance, and try and collect some of the children, the, the, the needy children. But because resources are small, they couldn't just accept all the children that were brought to them. They were actually having, can you imagine this now? They were actually having to choose the baby that looked the strongest, that might make it, and take that from the mother, and have to say no to some other mother who held their babies up, saying, please take my baby. It was horrific, though. I mean, I, I can't ever uh, remember a time that was as bad as that for me. Yeah, the danger is when we see these pictures, and we get it in England, we get a lot of pictures from Ethiopia and Sudan and so on. They're often so awful that it acts almost as an immunization against helping. Yes. Because, you know, it's too horrific and we shut our minds to it. And it's also so vast, the problem. You know, it's here, Bangladesh and Africa and Haiti, as you sing about. And you say, well, I can't do anything. It's the world as it is, and it seems also hopeless. 
Now, what little use can TFN be in a situation like this? Look, I mean, I can understand that people might feel that way. When I came back from Bangladesh, my mother, the first thing she said to me was, well, it's such a big problem. What's the point of putting my few pence in a bucket somewhere? But you see, we can't afford to think that way. I mean, the problem's certainly not going to go away if we don't put anything in the bucket. So it seems to me that we've got to start looking at it in the positive light and say that we as Christians have got to show that God does care. And one of the ways that we can show that He cares is out of our gratitude for what we've got, we give. And so therefore I would just encourage people to, to don't be fooled into thinking that way. It's a very destructive way. You know, we talk a lot. Bill and I are often invited to do an evening like this. And it strikes me sometimes that we speak about Jesus and about God, but we don't talk about the devil. Who do you think is to blame for all the problems in the world? God? Well, if he's of love, it can't be him. So it has to be the other one. And sometimes we forget that, you know, for instance, the devil must be hopping mad that we organize this evening. He does not like it when we praise God and say how great God is in his love. He must hate it when nurses and agriculturalists and doctors and engineers give their precious time to go out and help those people in the name of Jesus. He must really despise it. And uh, it's one of the easiest things, I think, that he does, one of the most d dreadful things, but probably quite easy for him, because he does touch on human emotions. He makes us feel useless. And the moment we feel useless, we become useless. So I don't think we should be dragged into that. But I can, you know, it is an understandable thing, because the problem is so vast. But I think we've got to start scratching at it. And we've got to start putting things, no matter how small we think it is, into the bucket. Because you see, the funny thing is, another of those lessons that I learned was, um, in fact, I, I can't remember who I heard tell this to somebody. I mean, nothing I say is original, believe me, I steal from everybody. But uh, it was the fact that, you know, when Jesus fed people on the mountain, you know, he said to his disciples, feed these people. Jesus knew these were poor fishermen. 3,000, 5,000 people, Jesus said, feed them. I mean, in that stage of their, their Christian lives, they had no idea what he meant, let alone how to do it. And yet, Jesus took a minute amount of fish and bread and fed thousands of people. The power of God is something that is, is huge and enormous and does function in this world if, we'll, if, we'll be, if we allow ourselves to be part of it and, and ask it of him too. So I would say don't, don't be discouraged. Please don't be discouraged. Um, you've seen the work that Tear Fund is doing. It's involved in all sorts of areas. As you've mentioned, Bill, it is a total privilege to go to some of these places. It is not the nicest experience, but it's an experience I wouldn't have missed. And sometimes it's too easy to present the poverty. Uh, sometimes I think we ought to sometimes say, I mean, we've been back to Kenya a number of, a couple of times and, 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 and many of these places that Tear Fund is involved and seen the positive work that's going on. Young men and women who have suddenly got jobs for the first time ever, just using the little talent they have to make something and then being shown how to make it and then how to sell it. There's a very positive work going on that would stop tomorrow if we all thought, I'm not given anymore because it's not enough. See, on our own, the richest of us in this world, if it was just left to us, wouldn't do anything at all. The power is amongst all of us people, not any one person. And the power that, for instance, came out of Live Aid and Band Aid was enormous. The only disappointment I have is that it has not continued. Tear fun goes on all the time. And that's another lesson I learned, you see. You can't afford to come home and think, that's it. I've done my bit. I've been there. I've had my photograph taken amongst the poor. That's it. It doesn't work because the poor are sometimes getting poorer the next day. They're dying every day. The problems do not stop. And we've simply got to continue to be uh, forceful in our giving. And I don't think, please don't think that anything you give is too small. It's not. The cynic, Cliff, will say to you, and I have to put this to you, that it's all right for you to be on a platform like this because you can afford it. Now, as you say, you do have wealth. And at home, you know, you have a a good car and a good house and all the rest of it and it's easy for you to speak about giving and so on it's easy for you to be generous how do you answer that criticism because that's what it is really well it's true isn't it really I mean the awful thing is I've said this before whenever we've done a tear fund evening uh, I've often wished that we could get everybody here on the strength of my name and then get everyone to listen to the nurses that we've we've met because it is my very position is a problem. My very position is a barrier to many, many people because they do uh, come up with that, that kind of conclusion about me. But you see, 
I, do, I think it's a little bit of a cop-out, really. Because even if I didn't exist as a Christian, those problems still do. It's no good just saying, oh, well, Cliff Richard can afford it, that's why he's saying it. Okay, forget me. Just supposing I'm completely and totally a fake. I'm totally a hypocrite. That You mustn't become hypocr hypocritical, therefore. You've still got to be positive about your giving. If I'm a hypocrite, it doesn't mean everyone else is in the Christian world. And uh, we, it, I do think it's a bit of a cop-out, though, because what people tend to want to do is for someone else to do it. Maybe that's why Live Aid and Band-Aid hasn't continued, because it seems to me that everyone wants them to do it. Everyone wants rock and roll singers to put on a concert or whatever, whereas the power, the power is definitely within the people of, of God's people. Terrific power there. So I, I wouldn't... I, I would say to the person who, who was questioning me in that way, I would say that I feared they were right that I'm probably the last person on this earth to be able to speak very authoritatively about this. But there again, you see, I, I mean, I have to say that they don't know what I do. They don't know how much time or money I give, and I don't intend to put out a great thing every week. Because if I did, of course, they'd say, of course, he just wants the publicity. So there's no winning in that, that um, argument, so I, I never even attempt it. So, you see, I, another lesson I learned was from Pauline Hoffman, the wife of... Um, the director of Tier Fund in, in England, he, she said to me once at a meeting, to whom much is given, much is required in return. And I thought, oh, that's absolutely true. The Bible actually takes care of me. I don't need a cynic to tell me that. God's already told me that through Pauline, a horrible woman. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, so th there are lots of lessons that we all have to learn, and you see, I have to deal with that fact. I have to deal with the fact that the Bible tells it is, is, it is more difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to get through the eye of a needle. You know, I've had to, I've had to figure out what that is meaning in my life, you know? The, the interesting factor was, it wasn't me that discovered this, but a friend of mine that said, well, of course, it doesn't say it's impossible. It says it's more difficult. And of course, well, the thing is, of course, I, I live in a world of affluence. Well, as you all do, we all do. I mean, Anybody who lives in Melbourne is a very fortunate person, I think. You look around and it's wonderful. And even the poorest person in Melbourne is going to be a multi-millionaire compared to the people that we saw photographed here. So it, is, it tends to be relative. But um, what was I going to say? No idea. <laughs> oh, yes. It, having financial, the, the, having the potential to earn money is a major, major problem in itself in terms of spirituality, in terms of being a Christian. Because to actually try and hold it in control, to have that in control, I've got people I know, I'm not going to name them, who, who live for, as we were talking about, as Steve was saying, about the whole point of their existence is to see how much they can earn. Uh, and I'm, I mean, that, that would be a very difficult problem for them to, to face if they were to become Christians, because one would have to say to them, you can't keep all you earn. You know, God demands, you know, the Old Testament talked about God's people tithing. You know, I, you know when I told my accountant that I wanted to tithe, he nearly fell over. <laughs> I mean, it's just not done. But the interesting thing is, you see, God asked for 10%. My manager at the time was asking 25. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> thank you. So it wasn't too difficult for me to deal with areas like that. But I mean, I don't think that I should be a problem for somebody else, you know. We've all got our, our own lives to lead and our own problems to face. And I've got mine and you've got yours. <laughs> Let me put you a really thorny problem which you touched on because you referred to God being a God of love. And let's deal with this before I ask you to sing that other song that you wrote in Haiti. Is God, you know, can you continue believing that God loves after a visit to Bangladesh, after seeing the little children that were rejected of those that you referred to. Now, I mean, we can bring it down to a personal level. There may be people in this audience who've gone through some personal tragedy. A, a relative has just died. A young person has been killed. You know, whatever. Some awful thing has happened. And we say, how, if God loves, can he permit that situation to exist. How do you deal with that? When you mentioned Bangladesh first, I, I, again, you know, you spend your whole life as a Christian learning about things. And uh, I learned a big, huge lesson, and it was about this very business, about 
love and suffering. And uh, it wasn't in spite of seeing pictures, it's because of Bangladesh that I realized that of course God loves. And you know what, again I tell you, I, nothing I ever say is original, or very rarely, because you, you, you tend to constantly feed off other people's experiences. We were visiting Bangladesh to, to see what the nurses were doing and make a film strip, one of the first film strips we made for Tear Fund, to let people back home know exactly what the problems were and what they could do to help. And uh, two of the nurses were speaking. We used to get together every night. We were there for what, five days or something like that. And we visited the various projects. And then at night we'd get together and we'd have a meal. And I had my guitar, so I sang a bit. And we sang together. We prayed together. We had a little bit of Bible study together. And then we just mingled. And two of the nurses were talking. One had just been there a few weeks. One had been there a few months. And these were two of the nurses who were the team of five that were in this Bangladesh hospital, this Dhaka hospital, where there were 500 beds. And the, the new little nurse said this very thing. She said to the other nurse, well, how can we believe in a God of love when we work in this terrible situation? You see, they were having to deal with people who were dying of diseases that are curable. Um, and the other nurse, who'd obviously been through the same things and come to a, a conclusion, said, we know that our God is a God of love because we are here. Now that's not trumpet blowing, that's recognizing. See, these girls came from, in fact, I think one of them certainly came from uh, a town uh, s south of London called Guildford. And it's a really lovely city, actually. Cathedral city built on hills. It's very beautiful and extremely middle class and, and very happy. Uh, she had actually left there to go there. And, and that's where all they, they'd all done that. They'd all come from fairly good backgrounds, really, and had devoted themselves for a number of, of months or years to to help people in Bangladesh. And why? Because every one of them in their Christian story would say it became obvious to them that God wanted them to do that. Who wanted them to do that? God wanted them to do that. Why? Because he does care for the people out there. If he didn't care for people out there, Tear Fund would not exist. If he didn't care for people out there, there wouldn't be a single Christian organization working. If he didn't care for people out in India, 90% of the hospitals wouldn't be Christian, which they are. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, a painful lesson to go and have to face that kind of poverty and disease and problem um, to realize that, yes, God does love. But you see, God has, there's, there's God power within Christianity. It's man power that we always seem to lack. Christianity is still, I believe, a minority group on the face of this earth. The cynics, of course, constantly want the impossible from us. What they forget is that what we need is more people to recognize God's love in their lives. And more people, therefore, would go out. And the chances of eradicating the problems would become greater. So, uh, yes, Bill, I don't have any problem with dealing with that now. If you ask me why does an earthquake happen or why does um, the Armenian tragedy take place, or, or you know, I, I don't have it. How can I have an answer for that? I just don't, I don't know. All I know is that there are two forces at work on this, on this earth, and one is good and one is bad, and, and the bad has freedom. The bad does and can do whatever he likes. If you take it to the story of Job, you know, you, you see what Satan could do to somebody. But you see, Job stayed faithful right through to the death in spite of all the injury that he suffered, in spite of all the tragedy, personal tragedy he suffered, his wife, his children, everything, everything from a very successful man, by the way, it brought to the dust with covered in sores, and yet he would never, ever stop loving God and being faithful to God. And I think that's, a, again, we've got to be like that. We've got to say that in spite of all that seems to be going wrong, we are going to remain true to what we believe and attempt to show the world that because of what we believe, something positive can happen in the world. Cliff, that last question is this, and it's really asked perhaps on behalf of the people in the audience, who are not Christians, okay, maybe you're interested and curious and whatever, but you can't honestly say that you share that commitment experience that you had. And they, folk may be saying, well, it's okay for you, Cliff. Your personality was such that in the mid-60s you needed this dimension in your life, and that's fine for you. We respect your position. But as for me, I don't need that spiritual dimension. I'm fulfilled in what I do, in my job, in my relationships at home. I don't even need any spiritual dimension to support Tia or any other charity because Christianity doesn't have a monopoly on goodness. 
So I don't need that Christ dimension. What, what do you say to them? I mean, do they? Well, I mean, I guess I suppose people do feel that and say that, but you see, I mean, I, I think one would have to be really firm, I suppose, and painfully firm and say, look them straight in the eye and say, who cares what you need? You know, what Christianity is offering, first and foremost, is the fact of Jesus. And after that fact, multiple other facts about Jesus that are either true or they're not true. If they're true, then it doesn't matter whether you need him or not. The fact of the matter is that he exists. And if he exists in truth, then he is the Son of God. Then he did die for people's sins. He was resurrected. And the things that he said are true, i.e., no man will ever come to the Father except he comes through me. I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. Now, do we want to get to God? Maybe this person doesn't think he needs God, but if God exists, you see, if Jesus exists, then all they're doing is saying, I know that they exist, but I don't want it. And I, would they seriously be telling me that therefore they're prepared to accept the consequences of rejecting this God? So, I mean, the idea that people have no need is ridiculous. I mean, it really is ridiculous. It's a major problem, of course, because you come back to the, the rich man. You see, uh, successful people tend to feel that they're self-sufficient. And, and, and certainly in our industry, one of the great problems in terms of getting Jesus presented to people is because they feel, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm number one in the charts. So why do I need anybody else or anything else for that matter? But you see, if they're logical, as I say, we don't have to be intellectual or academics to, to face this fact. If they're at all honest and logical, whether or not God exists is important. And if he does, then it, it transcends your particular feeling of need or non-need. It's a fact of life and, and people who are sensible have got to deal with it. Because surely if in fact it's true that Jesus can fill our lives and, and f fill it with a fullness that we can't imagine, then surely everybody in this, any, with any sense would want that anyway. So I mean, I, I would f find it relatively easy to be rude to someone like that. <laughs> Cliff, on that rude note, we'll end our discussion. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to sing again before we finish. But I wonder if I can just take two minutes, first of all, to thank you for talking to us and helping us maybe to think ourselves through some of these things. But I want maybe just to tie a couple of ends up. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. But just to pick up a couple of things that you said. First of all, for those who can't share that certainty of a Christian commitment, and let me just take out that little word you used, if. And we can all think along these lines. If God does exist, if God is, and if God is creator of our world, of Bangladesh and Haiti and southern Sudan, and if God loves, and if God sent Christ into the world 2,000 years ago, and those stories are true, and if Jesus lived his life as we read, and if his death really was for our forgiveness so that we can avoid that ultimate death, and if Jesus is alive, if that resurrection isn't just some nonsense story, but if he is alive in some dynamic spiritual way and can come in to people's lives as he did with Cliff in the mid-60s and change it around and give different priorities and attitudes, if all those things are true, then what a tragedy if we miss out, isn't it? If we go through life not experiencing that wisdom and that truth and that dynamic. And so perhaps part of the challenge of this evening is simply for you as an adult, as a thinking person, to get rid of all your misconceptions and all those hangovers from Sunday school and RE lessons at school maybe and actually face up honestly to some of the claims that the New Testament makes to ask your questions I don't know where you go to ask them maybe there is a local church that you have which you don't go to very often but you know it exists and you would have the confidence to go and find out some of the answers maybe a Christian friend has brought you this evening 
and you could tackle him or her about some of the things that bother you and puzzle you. But there are issues that are vital to think through. And if you come to different conclusions, then that's your freedom. But think them through. And there are those of you, of course, here who do know what tear is about, perhaps, and who would be able to say with great gratitude that, yes, there was a time in my life, too, when I made that sort of commitment, and Christ, for me, is also everything then maybe this evening it's just a reminder that there's a cost to discipleship. And there's that one demand that Jesus made that Cliff again referred to when he said that to whom much is given, much shall be required, for greater is their responsibility. That needs a lot of thinking through. Needs a lot of praying about, a lot of consideration but it's a principle that, again, we have to get to grips with. To whom much is given. I think that is you. It may not be as much materially as he's given to Cliff, but that's irrelevant. Relatively speaking, we have been given much, and therefore our responsibility is the greater. Thanks for being such a great audience. Cliff's going to end with one other song. The lyrics you'll know. It's an old hymn called When I Survey. And he's going to sing it simply because it has the answer to anybody that says, well, I don't know why I should be motivated to get involved either with the Christian gospel or with a ministry like Tear. If you're not sure of the reason why, listen again to the lyric because it's spelt out so clearly. <laughs>